Mickey, how's it going, man? It's going great. How are you, Jeremy? It's good to see you. Love the Christmas tree. You're on with uh, the Jeremy White Show, and uh, it's a double header today. We got D. Snyder joining us too. Oh, great, Mickey. Mickey this hey, hey, hey. is on my bad, my uh, confusion. I'm in another time zone, so uh, I called in at the wrong time. Uh, Jeremy, I don't have to do this. I don't want to uh, crash Mickey's uh, Mickey's interview. Well, no, it'll be kind of hey, interesting Dee. to have the both of you. I mean, like, two of the biggest man? names in, in the 80s. I mean, like, this is kind of cool. Well, you know, uh, well, Mickey knows I could be a handful, though. I I, uh, <laughs> I got a chance on a uh, 80s rock cruise to introduce uh, Mickey and the Starship. And Mickey's, and and I did my full blow like I was bringing Slayer on stage. <laughs> You know, I'm making you like, where do you go from there? I mean, <laughs> I just like lost my whole, I just unloaded the intro with everything I had. And I walked up to like Mickey to take over. Well, it's funny. I mean, like, look, both oh, of you wow. two totally different artists in the 80s. I mean, from the heavy metal side, I mean, Starship was pretty, you know, pop, like AOR kind of thing. Was it competitive for you guys? Like at the time, like was was like Twisted Sister anti-Starship? Like, or was, was Starship, you know, like screw metal? Well, from my uh, perspective, the, the beautiful thing about the 80s, music in the 80s and radio in the 80s, was that everybody was welcome to the club. You turn on one of the most popular, uh, you know, what we call CHR radio in the 80s, contemporary hits, and, you know, you get everything. You may have Twisted Sister, the next song might be Starship, the next song might be Thompson Twins, the next song might be White Snake, the next song Whitney Houston. You know, it was all over the map, which was a good thing. Yeah, my answer is if you go for a playback of the MTV 1984 New Year's party, I believe I'm on stage with Starship uh, at some point uh, <laughs> doing, a, doing a song with them. So uh, I don't think there was, there was no uh, animosity at all. No. I mean, a lot of people would say that, I mean, like, oh, you know, screw metal or, you know, I'm a pop artist. But it's funny you say that because, you know, today you put on Z100, you'll hear rap and you'll hear, you'll hear Dua Lipa, but you won't hear anything with rock guitar on it. So the fact in mid 80s, you had it all on CHR radio. Yeah, that was what was great about it. Like I said, everybody, everybody was welcome to the club. It was beautiful. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm going to kiss up here, suck up, as I say, I, I'm a fan of Vicky singing. His voice just, always just blew me away. I was like so angry that I could have trouble singing his songs. I was actually wondering the day, Ricky, this is, I'm down here in my house in Belize, hence the yeah. peach background and ceiling fan. Um, but uh, I was, I said, I wonder if he sings Fools Around and Fools Around and Fell in Love with the Starship because it was such an amazing song, but it was Elvin Bishop. It wasn't a Starship yeah. thing. Yeah, well, I am now, there was a point in the 80s, uh, well, especially in the Jefferson Starship, where I did not do Fool's Around and Fell in Love, but now I do it every night now. You know, it's a, it's a staple of the set. And I, it, it's still, it's probably my favorite song to sing in the show. Amazing vocal performance, but uh, enough kissing up. Yeah, well, talk <laughs> well that's about okay. Christmas. I was going to say, you know, talking about Christmas, Mickey's got a brand new uh, EP, uh, two songs, uh, a classic Christmas. Check it out now, wherever you get your music. D, speaking of Christmas, I mean, I was talking to Mitch LaFon. I was telling him that I was going to be interviewing you, and he said, uh, you know, make sure D gives thanks to Quebec and, of course, Queen Celine for buying him that house in Belize. Yeah, yeah. So, so Mickey, I don't know if you know this story, but um, in the early 90s, I guess it was, maybe late 80s, early 90s, my wife, uh, Suzette, who have been with 47 years, yeah. she uh, came to me and said, write me a Christmas song. And I said, what? She said, write me a Christmas song. I said, do you know how genre specific Christmas songs are? Like, when's the last time you heard a, a song that made you, gave you that Christmas feel, a new one? It's so rare. It's so hard to capture that, that nuance, that subtlety, that essence that Christmas songs have. And she said, you're a classically trained countertenor. You can do it. And I am a classically trained countertenor originally, uh, Biggie. Yeah. Uh, so I said, I don't I know. I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah, I said, I'm metal. I'm metal. I don't write Christmas songs. Well, I was working on some stuff, and I suddenly got an idea for a song, not a rock song. It wasn't even in my range. And I wrote it, and um, I got a session singer and session players to record it. Merry Christmas. Gave it to my wife. Cut to 
five years later, I get a call at a particularly low point in my career. The engineer on the session was now producing Celine Dion's holiday record. And oh. he played her the song and she wanted to record it. And he asked if I was cool with it. I said, did you tell her who wrote it? He said, not yet. I said, do not tell her. He's not going to wrote the song. Please, just put it on the record. And it's uh, the biggest selling holiday record in history. 14 million albums sold, copies sold. And uh, and we call this the house that St. Celine built in, in uh, Belize. Thank you, Celine. <laughs> That's a great story, man. You know, you never know, do you? You know, where it's going to come from, what's going to happen, you know, that bolt from the blue uh, that's part of the beauty of what we do i guess and this is probably the only song i didn't write to release commercially it was no yeah. one no one the last thing a lot of people know is d snyder wrote a christmas song and uh, for celine dion and uh but uh it may make me more money than anything i've ever done which is crazy Absolutely. yeah yeah but that's the thing you uh, never know right i mean like you don't intend or plan on writing a hit it just sort of happens I yeah. don't know, yeah, Mickey. Do you, you ever set out to write a hit? Well, uh, no, uh, because you know so many factors come into it. You know, you you have you have a song. You know, maybe it's a great song. You record it. You try to get the best performances you can uh, when you're making the record. But then a lot of other factors come in, like the the label, the record company. Where's radio at that point in time? What what are you up against? You know, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with Mickey's assessment. Now that I think about it, I mean, I try to write um, a, a song that I think will really reach people. Um, when I, and usually when I'm done with it, like we're not gonna take it. When I wrote, we're not gonna take it. Uh, I said, I well, the chorus came to me in 1980. It was three years later when I figured out how to finish the song. But I knew, I said, this is a winner. Will it get a chance to be a hit? That's the question. There's yeah. so great songs that uh, you and I both wrote, Mickey, or other people have written that didn't get the spotlight shined on it, didn't get the push, didn't get yeah. the opportunity. It doesn't make them any less songs. It just, there's a lot more to a hit than just a great song. You're right. Timing, you know, a lot of timing, a lot of, a lot of luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of artists say that. I mean, like a lot of songwriters say, you know, I had this uh, title sitting in a notebook for like 10 years and then I wrote it and it became, you know, like Lady Gaga, Poker Face. And be like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you, you never know, like something could turn into something a decade from that point. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's like you just shoot an arrow into the air, you know, and you don't always know where it's going to land, right? Yeah, that's it. Uh, you know, like I was saying about where I could have taken it, I wrote the chorus and I just could not, I kept returning to it, trying to figure out how, what the verse was, what the B verse was, like how it was going to, I just couldn't get it. And probably to Mickey's point about timing, I wrote it in 1980. We hadn't even signed a record deal. We went to an independent label. If that song was done, it would have been a throwaway on an independent record with our first company went tits up within a month of the time they released. It would have just been lost there. Yet three years later, I was finally on Atlantic Records. We had one under our belt with them. We were sort of poised for that opportunity. And I figured out, okay, this is how to finish that song. It goes on that album and it gets the green light, so to speak, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, that was the one, right? <laughs> the big thing. Yeah. The keeps on like, giving, Mickey. Yeah. Keeps yeah. on giving. You know, I got to tell you, I remember the first time I ever saw you uh, perform, it was one of the first tours I ever did with Jefferson Starship. It was probably 1979 or 1980. We Dude. were playing, I believe it was Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah. And, and, and Twisted Sister was opening for Jefferson Starship. And we got down to the show and I saw like your, your road crew and everybody was there. And it was kind of like, like a biker gang with makeup on. You know, and I'm more like, whoa, what is this? You know, this is different. I can't believe you remember that. Yes. Oh, yeah. So let me explain to the audience. So we were very regionally popular, and we would get the opportunity in, in the New York tri state area to open for band, Blue Oyster Cult, mm -hmm. Judas Priest. We, and we got to open for the Jefferson Starship, Mid Hudson Civic Center, 1979. Yeah. And we put out our first, it was our own release, a 45. And one of the songs on it was called Under the Blade. And uh, and W, uh, I can't remember the name. I'm on the station now with my syndicated show. But a station up there started playing the song. 
and it became like a local thing, and we got the chance to open for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and we were a biker gang wearing makeup. Yeah, that yeah, pretty it much. Made, it made a big impression. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at this. Uh, look how great. much fun it, we're having. It's a good thing, D, you were late. Look at this. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that D and I talked about on the cruise, too, when we were together, was that we both have had the opportunity to perform in uh, Rock of Ages, playing yeah. the same role of Dennis, the, the club. Dennis Dupree, yeah. Yeah. And and so we had, you know, we shared that experience. And also in the movie version of uh, Rock of Ages, you know, there's a point in the film where uh, the rockers are squaring off against the the, the, uh, the Christian community that wants to shut down the club and all that. So one side of the street is singing, we built this city. And then the other side of the street is retaliating with, we're not going to take that's, it. That's <laughs> right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's it's so funny. When I, so uh, when I was in Rock of Ages, you may have had a similar uh, experience. So the first time they put me in the show, and I, as Dennis Dupree, I didn't sing we're not going to take it or I want to rock, which were both right. in the show. I'm singing other songs. And the actors kept coming off stage going, was that okay? Was that okay? Like after they did my song, was that okay? Like, you know, I'm like, dude, it's, you know, I'm not here to judge you. Just sing it the way you sing it. But I, you know, yeah. definitely people, when, you, when the actual guy who wrote the song, who sang the song is there, it shakes people up. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, it, and it, same thing with me because Built the City was in the production, but I didn't sing it in the show. You know, I'm singing like, uh, you know, uh, too much time on my hands. Yeah, uh, yep. You know, the other things, yeah. <laughs> so, it yeah, it, it was a great experience. So it, was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done and one of the mm -hmm. most rewarding things I've ever done. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. Um, eight shows a week, and that's what mm -hmm. I was doing. Uh, two on, you know, uh, one a day and two on the weekends each day. Yeah. It's, real, it's intense. You know, it's not a lot of singing per se, but it's, you know, it's really a, a hectic schedule and it's nonstop. You know, you know yeah. maybe um, 48 hours, depends how they schedule you. And uh, But it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Very well, different. Yeah, I was just so like, intimidated like by, the, by, the, by the talent. The, in the in the cast, you know. Damn. I went up back first day of rehearsal. I finished rehearsal. I went back. I told my wife, I said, pack up, we're going home. I said, these people are way too talented for me. I, I can't compete with this. You know? <laughs> I can't keep up. One, was that all in one city or were you guys touring that? Like was uh, it hard? I, to be I on did the road I did or... a production. I did a production in Seattle. Okay. Um, up there. I think D was in New York as I was I was on I got to be on Broadway, yeah. which was right that in itself. I think that was my parents who never really got the rock and roll thing, you know, just yeah. did not get that, but they loved musicals. Right. And just to, to see for them to go down to a Broadway theater. I saw the pictures of them standing in front of the marquee and starring D Snyder was up yeah. there and they were beaming. It, I, I, they, I saw a response out of them that and the Celine Dion song, but that I never saw my entire rock and roll career, but being on Broadway, that was something these people from that generation could connect with. That was a big deal. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It is a big deal. <laughs> Mickey, when you first heard We Built the City, I mean, like, obviously written by Bernie Taupin, who wrote some of the greatest Elton John songs. I mean, when you first heard that yeah. demo, did you think that that was going to be a big hit? Like, that would be one of the biggest songs ever? No. Of course not. I, I got the demo from my friend Martin Page. And what attracted me to the song was uh, more, the uh, lyric and the kind of tone of the demo, the original demo was a little more like a Peter Gabriel kind of groove, you know, like a more like a shock the monkey kind of thing. And so I love that. And I brought it into the to the band and the producers. I said, this is a pretty cool song. And the lyrics were great because it's Bernie Taupin, right? And, um, and they said, uh, the producer said, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it doesn't have a chorus. You know, I said, oh, well, so what? <laughs> so uh, they came up with the idea of writing the anthemic chorus, which, you know, we built this city, which of course was a double-edged sword because that's probably the reason the song became a big hit, but it's also probably the reason that uh, some people were not not that receptive to the right. song and that it, because it became such a, you know, like it, it, it became the poster child of a lot of things about music that people didn't particularly care for in the mid 80s you know transitioning from the analog into the digital age and all that kind of stuff but it was the lyric that attracted me to it in the verse 
Well, I mean, it's been called everything from the worst song ever recorded, but I mean, it's ubiquitous <laughs> yeah. of the eighties. I mean, like it was on MTV. I mean, I was talking to Mitch LaFon about it. He's like, it was everywhere. You couldn't escape the song and right. you either loved it or hated it. It, yeah. it, it seems that the hate fades. Uh, I remember, um, you know, just a case in point, uh, Kiss did a disco song. And as a Kiss fan and as a rocker, I was made for loving you. Yeah. It was like, we were like angry. And now, well, uh, theoretically, they've retired. I said on social media, when I see their bodies in the Kiss coffins, then I'll believe it. But, yeah. uh, yeah. but, uh, but, but now they would do that. Would they do that every night to their audience? And with the, as the years went by, people lost that animosity, and that was just part of the fabric of the Kiss legacy. Just like Built a City is an yeah. essential part of Starship. Yeah, yeah. You know, you if you stick around, if you're lucky enough to stick around long enough, you go through different phases of your career. You know, where you're trying different things and maybe different musical styles, and uh, and that was just kind of like one period for us that knee deep in the hoopla period. But it became, you know, three number one singles in eighteen months. So that's what everybody remembers, you know, and yeah. um, more than anything else. So uh, you know, it really wasn't until about maybe 10 or 12 years after the song came out, that that sort of negative bandwagon started happening. Uh, it started with Blender Magazine. And then a lot of people kind of jumped on that bandwagon and it kind of snowballed. And But, you know, originally we didn't get that much negative uh, feedback from the song. No, I mean, the video was every uh, MTV, yeah. I mean, like, you, you couldn't escape it. It was, it was everywhere. I kind of hate the video. Yeah. <laughs> the video was not one of our best. That was one of those deals where you show up, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning to shoot a video and the director has no clue as to what you're going to do. And so, you know, you sit around for about six hours and say, well, we got to do something. So we just kind of <laughs> made it up on the fly, you know, and threw a bunch of stuff into that video that there was no concept, uh, a, like a, a, a lot of post-production stuff, but it, it, you know, it's okay, but it's not my favorite. Yeah. Talking about that, I mean, D, look, Kiss just retired. I mean, like, we're getting closer and closer to 2030 at this point. All these bands, like all the legendary, like classic legacy bands, I mean, in the next 10 years, they're going to be gone. We're not going to have White Snake. We're not going to have the Def Leppards. I mean, like, you know, Twisted Sisters already wrapped it up. I mean, is is that what's 2031 going to look like? I mean, five years from now, does that mean we're not going to have any more stadium rock shows? Like, it's kind of weird to think about, right? And, you know, people ask me about the music situation today, and I don't know what Nick, uh, Mickey's experience is, but I have had the, the, the pleasure of going to shows with my kids who are all headbangers, and they take me to the little places. And I see the same passion that I had. I see the same, just, just this is what I got to do that, yeah. that Mickey and I had. But sadly... They've got no hope of ever becoming rich, becoming famous, making a living doing it. They're they're just they tell you know they're in a van towing a trailer, hoping just to make it to the next town. And yeah. on one hand, it's so genuine because it is that love that I had when I started, and Mickey had with uh, you know where we're not not had the past tense, but you know when we were kids, just like my dad used to say. You're making like 13 cents an hour. And I said, Dad, I would do it for free. I'd do it for free. And that was the truth. But at least we had the hope that maybe if all the stars aligned, maybe we could have a hit record. Maybe we could have success. Maybe it could be the way we made our living. I don't think the kids, the young musicians today have any hope. And that's um, where I'm going with that is, and because of that, we don't have the rock stars. We don't have the large yeah. life personalities that filled an arena stage that fill a stadium stage. I always said the reason God gave me a head this big was to be in front of a gigantic audience. I'm not <laughs> made for clubs. The head's too big. So, uh, so, you know, that's the part I think that's what's lost. I think rock stars, arena rockers they're just not gonna i don't think they're gonna get the chance but what do you think like artists can do this i mean like these kids are up and coming a lot of like, guitars are huge so many guitars are fun obviously drums is like the number one gift this year apparently on like a bunch of lists like the musicians are mm. out there but nobody's making it 
that is interesting about that. I didn't know that the drums were the number one gift. Yeah. But yeah, I, you know, um, you know, I, I agree with D. It's kind of like you know, music is gonna obviously gonna go on. There's gonna be arena shows, but it's there's just it, it's not bands. It's not rock bands anymore. You know, it's like you know, pop artists and people who are kind of. Uh, it's not that they're not really talented people, but but as as D mentioned, you know, the way we came up, you know, you're all sleeping together in a van and driving around the country and going gig to gig. And you're kind of like uh, you were a power culture, you know, and you had to make a lot of sacrifice to make it. And, um, and chances are, you probably weren't going to, but you loved it anyway. You know, it was a choice, a huge but there choice. Was a, there was the possibility yeah. and that hope, that glimmer of light. I, you know, I've, I've met so many of these young artists and there's talented again and passionate. I remember I brought my daughter, uh, to back of course, because they, you know, because I'm their dad, you know, they get to back to meet everybody they love and go backstage. And she brought all of her, well, this is a few years back already, but CDs, because I make her buy everything. I made her buy everything. You have to buy, you can't download it. Yeah. And she presented them to the guitar player in the band. He said, Why'd you buy these? And he just said, My dad made me. He goes, Wow. He says, I don't even buy CDs. Yeah. Like the artist himself was shocked that someone had paid for their 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 work, That's and ridiculous. it was that unexpected. You know, it's just it's it's sad. Yeah. You can't even buy a new car with a CD player in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Give out, people give out CDs. Like, what am I going to stick this in? Yeah. Well, That's look sad. at that. I mean, have you noticed that your you know your back catalog sales have gone down because of the limited access to CDs or the physical product, the the players? Oh yeah, uh, me, me personally, we're killed. We're we're Spotify, uh, the, the 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 wholesale. You know, you pay a one monthly fee. We're getting so so little. And a guy from Spotify, I want to take. It should be taken out and shot. When uh, he heard that artists were complaining about how little we get paid, his response was, "Make more music." Like we're producing cans of Coke. You know, yeah. just the production. You know, uh, you know yeah. more make more music. You know, with those insulting and belittling um, for me and probably with songs like Built This City as well, it's yeah. uh, licensing. The licensing is the last godsend, the last oasis where you can actually make some money. Right. You know, yeah. Steven Spielberg chooses we're not going to take it for the finale of Ready Player One. Thank you, God. Yeah, exactly. uh, so I'm not getting anything from Spotify. Yeah, you know, placement, you know, uh, movies, commercials, whatever, you know, if you can be fortunate enough to get something like that. Yeah. Uh, that was, I mean, but hey, but that's why the live performances are so important now, too, because, you know, we can still go out there on stage and deliver the goods and people will buy a ticket to come see you and see you, you know, see that energy and see it happen live on stage and sound, you know, not exactly like the record, but as good as the record. You know? Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, Mickey, hey, Mickey I'm, uh, I wanted to just say to somebody the other day, how many jobs are there that in your retire in as you get older, you can still do it, go back, people will pay you even more to do the job. Yes. Normal jobs, you're, 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 you age out, some young kid replaces you, and I retired a few years ago, but the offers are still coming in. And oh, yeah. if you need to... I say, okay, you know, all right, I'll go back out and do it and get, I mean, no, there's no job like that. Not for, not for regular people. They can't keep working into their 70s. They can't do it. 80s. Jagger's going out. He's 80. He's 80. He's I know. Out. It's crazy. Yeah. And he's got uh, a new kid. You know, fortunately, <laughs> and, and like you said, it's kind of crazy if, if, you know, you do it long enough and you're fortunate enough to, to live as long as we have. And, yeah. and that you start getting, I'm getting benefits now financially from things that I did 35 years ago, you know, that are just now some of the rewards, reaping the rewards of that, which is kind of crazy, but, but, yeah. but thankfully it's happening, you know, but it's good. At least you're getting something out of it. I mean, like, you know, yeah. the kids today, mm -hmm. like, look, they get a hundred thousand views on their song on YouTube or whatever. Like, yeah, I got it. But like, is that success? Like, how do you even gauge success these days? Is, is I, the I don't know. Like, you know, like 20 cents on a stream. <laughs> You know, yeah, I know. 20 cents, my 
that that's not what they're getting. I remember seeing something yeah. crazy like Psy Gangnam Style had like a billion views and he got like sixty five thousand dollars. Yeah, a billion views, right. a billion. So a hundred thousand things they're getting pennies, literally pennies. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah, even on like YouTube for like you know creators that do like podcasts and stuff, it's like you get a hundred thousand views. Like, okay, maybe I got like eight hundred bucks out of it or something. But it's like all the labor that goes into that process of getting it going. It's like it's it's pretty fucked. Like you know how the compensation just went from here to just nowhere. But everybody else makes the money except the actual creators and the artists. Yep, <laughs> you uh, said it. Jimmy. Yeah, it's hey, a so mixed this, up, uh, shook up, this... muddled up world. <laughs> yeah, it is. Except for Lola. So, D, you got this new graphic novel out with Z2 Comics. He's not going to take it. It's available now. You go and check it out. Uh, geez, this thing's phenomenal. The artwork, everything's ridiculously amazing inside of it. What, what made you want to do this graphic novel to, uh, you know, is it to immortalize the whole thing from 1985? Or like, what was the intention behind it? So, uh, so yeah, Mickey, um, the, the, a graphic novel, you know, comic book yeah. of, it's called He's Not Going to Take It. And um, Z2 Comics, they approached me. The the C word censorship is a hot, as much of a hot topic today as it was almost forty years ago. The pendulum yeah. has swung. We've gone from a right wing puritanical, self righteous, we must reel in rock and roll to, oh oh, you can't say that. You might offend somebody, and if you do say it, we're going to cancel you. We're going to cancel. So it's going to become a left wing, super oversensitive, protect everybody, coddle yeah. and wrap them in bubble wrap because fear that somebody's feelings might get hurt. So it, but it's still censorship. Either version is still censorship. And they not want, they felt it was, there was interest. It's his, it's history going to Washington with Frank Zappa and, and John Denver as they did. But I also wanted to examine what, how did I become that voice at that time and in the in the comic they go back there's a shot of me in the cradle there's literally a, a, a comic book drawing of me in a crib with my parents Ooh, ah. and but it they said how did this outcast nerd as i was just uh, just misfit uh, somehow arrive at that point in time where he walked into that senate hearing and spoke on behalf of rock and roll and and shocked the world pretty much people were well i was stunned they, like, and they, they didn't they didn't know that i could speak english fluently so uh they, they were really shocked well that's what how it happened because you're intelligent articulate you have strong you. feelings and you know how to express the feelings in a way that uh that gets through to people and that people can understand and uh yeah you know and, and, and a strong personality so i I see how that happens. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, you know, thanks for saying that. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, and they just feel, and there are people, just as there are people today who uh, will only listen to audiobooks. Have you seen, heard the, yeah. I only, I don't read, I read audio. Well, there are people who like to get the information in that graphic novel, comic book form, and they figure, they figure it'll reach another audience. You know um that uh, and and share the story with them so it's 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 really interesting because i being approached now people talk about doing a biopic about it it, it, yeah. it was it's oddly it's it's overshadowing almost my musical efforts uh this moment in time and it's pretty amazing because all i was just hey man i just they asked me if i would speak and i said hell yeah yeah, yeah. i just yeah. thought i was carrying the flag for rock and roll and that was the honor yeah. enough you know, but it's kind of funny Absolutely. that they thought you'd come in there and just be like a total fucking idiot. Meanwhile, I mean, like the biggest, you know, contrary to popular belief, musicians are pretty fucking smart. Like, well, you know, yeah. 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 um, <laughs> you know, there's a few Jim Danny Mangrum um, and Vince Neil. You know, there's a couple that uh, might have been better choices than me. You know, I mean, if Jim Dandy went in there, people make, you know who Jim Dandy is. Uh, Jim Dandy. Or, or got, I think they've got a much different result. <laughs> much different result. Yeah, you're going with all of those like coontails hanging off of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, they didn't what they just what they did was they looked at the image, they saw the picture and said, Oh great, this guy, you know, we'll bring it, we'll drag him in here and make a fool out of him in front of the whole world uh, if they had spent even two seconds just read anything it was that oh he doesn't drink or do drugs wait a second we don't want a yeah. sober guy in here he might make right. sense 
you know, yeah. so they just picked the wrong guy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Z2comics.com, if you want to go check it out, he's not going to take it. D. Snyder is great. And uh, Tom Morell did a fantastic forward at the beginning, too, which was awesome of him. Well, Tom is a freedom fighter, and uh, I just want to say it's the holiday season. Makes a great stocking stuffer, yep. along with my novel, France, which is available, and my Funko Pop, which a D. Snyder Funko Pop is available now. G G D, you're almost as bad as Gene Simmons. Look at you. Sam. I know. I don't do anything but sell things and sign things now. What, what is the What is the Funko Pop? Those are little dolls they make with the big heads. You see them. Oh it's yeah, a, yeah. And they make them of celebrities and rock stars and athletes and movie characters and uh, and they honored me with a Funko Pop. And then people are crazy about collecting them. It's 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 they're fanatical about collecting these things. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, of course, Mickey Thomas, uh, Starship, this awesome EP, just classic Christmas stuff. I'm there. Like, what made you want to do Christmas music, by the way? Just like I've always wanted to do uh, Christmas songs, and I've just never had really the opportunity to do it. And suddenly, you know, um, my manager helped put it together for me. He had a good friend in Nashville who's a producer in Nashville, Danny Frizzell, and uh, you know, I expressed an interest to do it. I said, you know, I wanted to do really old school, classic, traditional. Uh, Christmas, you know, I, I I don't want to rock it up or jazz it up. You know, I want to be, I want to channel, you know, Andy Williams and Jack Jones and that wow. kind of thing, you know. So well, what so song did you record, Mickey? Which ones did you record? I did Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas and It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Awesome. So we did those two. We figure we'll test the waters and, you know, if we get a good response, maybe 2024, we'll come out with a whole Christmas album. See, yeah. what, see what happens. Hey, you know what? Mickey Thomas' whole Christmas show next year. Why not? Well, yeah, why not? You know, I've done been it. Working for Brian <laughs> Setson's been doing it for years, right? So, yeah, seriously. TSO, they, their whole career is Christmas shows at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, look, it was so great to talk to you guys. Uh, Mickey, I got one last question for you, which is super yeah. random. And D, I don't know if this is interesting to you or not, but one of my favorite songs ever, and it's super, super obscure. I didn't mean to stay all night, written by Mutt Lang, that yeah. Starship recorded. What's the story behind that? And how did you get Mutt Lang to produce and give you that amazing song? Well, um, that song, the, the album Love Among the Cannibals was being produced by Mike Shipley, uh, amazing, who was the engineer, engineer. for, yeah. Yeah, he was engineered all of the stuff that Mutt was producing at that point in time, De you know, Def Leppard and other things. And um, so, um, so in the course of working with Mike on that album, Mutt brought that song in for us, a song he had written. Uh, to uh, present to the band and we we recorded it and um, and Mutt you know because it was his song and it was his baby and it was close to his heart you know obviously he got very involved in the production of that particular one and uh, I got a chance to go to England I'd always wanted to record in England and I never had it and so I went to went to London and did the lead vocal for that song with Mutt and Mike at a studio in London and uh, and uh, you know it has it has the Mutt Mutt's Fingers are all over it, you know, oh, yeah. his style and his influence. Oh, those and, backing uh, vocals are just phenomenal. I mean, that's the sound of Def Leppard. That's Mutt Lang on those backing Well, vocals. yeah, it is Mutt. You know, he does quite a few tracks of backing was it, vocals. Was it difficult to have vocals produced by Mutt? Like, did he really push you further than you'd gone before? Because you hear all these stories about working with him. What was your experience with Mutt? Well, it was different. It was very different than most of the producers I'd ever worked with because, you know, I'm the kind of singer for me, it's mostly all like feel, you know, and, um, you know, trying to just, you know, capture the, the magic and uh, the passion. I'm, I'm not exactly a real technical singer. So I like to just kind of go out in the studio and kind of blow through a song, you know, two or three times, you know, take a few, you know, re record a few tracks, put it together. And, but Mutt was excruciatingly difficult in the sense that he's the exact opposite of that it's line by line word by word over and over and over and over like i'm not a, i'm not kidding like 30 35 takes in a row on one line of a song i call him the stanley kubrick of pop you know because he's like <laughs> take wow. after take after take yeah. so so that was a. Uh, it made me kind of want to pull my hair out but um, I just kind of went with the flow and went with the process and said, well, you know, this is the way he does things. So this is the way we're going to do it because he's a nice guy. It's not like he's being a jerk about it or anything. That's just, uh, that's just his way, you know, his method. And, um, but it was very different for me. 
just to oddly tie together something that I was telling you earlier that I couldn't finish, we're not going to take it. Look, songwriting is a craft, as as Mickey knows, and the more you write, the better you get. And you and you develop your craft by listening to other writers and studying structure. And um, Def Leppard was having such success with the Mutt Lang produced stuff. I was studying those records, and it was yeah. studying those that I heard how he was structuring some of the songs. That I said, oh. Oh, 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 oh. It wasn't a melody. It wasn't taking a melody. I was just seeing how he, and what it really was, was he was doing variations in one song, variations of the hook on the verse. And I went and I said, oh, and I took the Mutt Lang inspiration and went yeah. and, and reapproached, we're not going to take it. And 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 the verse, we're not going to take it, is a, is a variant of the chorus itself. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, Mutt Lang's a brilliant, brilliant producer he is you know he's very atmospheric his productions you know so so much texture is going on there and that was and it, that's pretty cool you know and you know when you mentioned that about songwriting too you know diane warren who's one of the most prolific and best you know songwriters uh I, i've noticed about her too many of her songs the chords don't change from the verse to the chorus it's the same chords only the only the melody changes, you know. See, that's an eye opening thing when you're a songwriter yeah. because you're because I was whatever I was trying to do with when I'm going to take it, I was trying to go someplace else and then realized yeah. when listening to you know a more seasoned writer like Mutt say, oh, it's cool to just stay in that same place and just play with the melody a little bit. You've got to go yeah. take off. Some songs you do have to do that, but not this one. Yeah. And, Obviously, the inspiration worked. Yeah, and yeah. look, a lot, a lot of songwriters from you know, like uh, everybody kind of says, you know, keep it simple. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, you know, it depends. You know, uh, you know, one of my favorite artists is Peter Gabriel, and he is far from keeping it simple. But <laughs> but well, you know, I love it's I all love over the place. Too. But if you strip yeah. those songs down onto an acoustic, tar, it's still a melody, lyric, and and chords. But you can do it and, you a, want and a great production. groove. A great groove, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Even like I used to say, I used to say, Mickey, all I need is the drums. I said, if everybody else, if everybody else craps out, as long as I've got the drums going, I'll just keep singing. You know, That's right. yeah. drums and vocals, man. Just taking <laughs> actually, it back to like you know, taking it back to prehistoric times, beating on a log and singing, right? Yeah. I actually have a funny story about that. I interviewed Brian Adams and I asked him about working with Mutt and he told me the story about how he was writing this, working on this song. They spent like six weeks on this song. They tracked guitars, bass, vocals, everything, and they weren't feeling this verse. So Mutt just finally said, okay, well, hold on a second. And he armed record on the board, every, every track, guitar, like every single thing they'd done for the verse, except the drums, recorded over it, punched out the chorus. And Brian was like, what are you doing? He's like, well, you said you didn't like the verse, so let's write a new one. And he was like, we spent six weeks on this shit, oh and it was God. gone. It's like, he just deleted it. So he said, you, you know, deleted Mutt it. To, wow, that's yeah, pretty cool. he completely ballsy. deleted it. So he said the lesson he learned from Mutt was, like, don't be precious with your ideas. Don't be afraid to, you know, try again. Yeah. Yeah. But imagine that, wow. a whole verse. You said six weeks tracking, like, layers of guitars, and Mutt was like, oh, we'll just delete it. Gone. Yeah. It's it's pretty wild how stories like that can happen. Tom, I, I interviewed Tom Worman, D, and I uh, I was talking to him about working with you guys, and he said that th that experience was uh, it was hit or miss. What what was your experience like working with Tom? Tom Worman? Don't recall. Don't recall the name. No, producer. I give him nothing. He gets <laughs> nothing. From <his> <laughs> That's what I figured. Who? <laughs> I remember Jeff Workman. I remember a great engineer producer named Jeff Workman. I ever ever know Jeff Workman, Mick? No, um, I don't know him. He worked with Roy Thomas Baker, and yeah. he was the engineer on all of the Queen albums, early yeah. Queen, all of the Cars records, yeah. all of the Journey albums. Yeah. And he wound up being the co-producer uh, on the album with Any Way You Want It. It was uh, – it was – so he was an amazing, amazing engineer. And um, 
in my darkest moments, he passed on, unfortunately, amazingly <laughs> talented. And uh, he, in my darkest moments, he he would lift, would lift me up many times. I remember one time I was just really just, uh, I was distraught over what was going on with my album and how it was being produced. And Jeff said, give me a piece of paper. And he said, he was an Englishman, I won't do his accent. And he, he wrote, and he wrote on a piece of paper, I, Jeff Workman, swear this album will go at least platinum or I will quit the business. <laughs> Jeff Workman signed and then witnessed by the engineer. And uh, and he handed it to me and he goes, this he says, here's your here, here's your you know guarantee. Here it is. Don't worry yeah. about it. this record's gonna be huge. And to this day, on my triple platinum disc uh, for Stay Hungry laminated is this piece of memo paper that I Jeff know. wrote that message in a red pen and it's right there in the in the record so uh Jeff Workman thank you for making say Hungry album amazing the other guy and I don't I don't know who that is it was hardly <laughs> there I love that I, I fucking love that well look guys it was yeah. so great to talk with you this is this is awesome man what a great way to spend uh, a December Thursday afternoon this is this yeah is man it's been great Loved it. Thank you, I, Mickey, I thank you for I allowing me in. Appreciate it, brother. Hey, thank you, D. I didn't know we were going to be able to do this together, but it's been a great experience. It's great seeing you again. Likewise. You. likewise. All right, Merry on. Christmas, my friend. Have a good you one. Too, man. And hope to see you out there one of these days. We will. We'll be on a cruise or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Take uh, care. You got to get on another cruise and uh, do the big intro for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think they're going to ask me again. I was just too amped <laughs> up. I was just too amped up. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jeremy.